Welcome everyone! It is winter 2018. I am here to bring you through about 20, 20 25 anime series. Uh, let me see, I have a count here of how many things I am previewing. 26 anime this season that I'm going to be going through. It's not absolutely everything, and I should point out before we begin, uh, the list is that I'm not counting season 2s or season 3s. I'm not counting anything that's ongoing. So, you know, Boruto, I'm not continuing on with that. Um, there are also a few things that um, just didn't really interest me. So stuff for, like, really, really little kids. So that's clearly, like, for a a, um, like a really young 8-year-old kind of an audience, or like even, like, a, a preschool audience. I'm not counting those. Um... Um, but pretty much, and also I'm not doing OVAs, ONAs, movies, stuff like that. It's just TV series. So, FYI. Um, there are a few I know even that, that count that that I haven't gotten to. Violet Evergarden, I've not gotten a chance to see. I apologize for that. Just haven't gotten around to it. But I do have 26 anime. So, let's get to it and start talking about all of these anime, starting with After the Rain. So, this is an anime series about a... It sounds creepy, but it's about a... Um, high school girl who works at a family restaurant run by a middle school guy and um, she has developed a little bit of a schoolgirl crush on him and he's developed a kind of an interest in her like it's not really a um, it's really sort of an adult crush where he's not seriously planning to go out with her um, but he sees her and it's kind of one of those if only I were her age I would I would love to date someone like her, that kind of thing. So it's not quite that creepy in terms of, you know, adult with uh, stuff. Sorry, yeah, not, middle, not, not a middle school guy, a, a I'm sorry, middle-aged guy. Sorry. Thank you. Confusing. Um, so the middle-aged guy working at the restaurant and high school girl, middle-aged, not middle school. Okay, so um, the important thing about After the Rain is the attention to artistic detail. This is a gorgeously drawn anime series. The animation itself is um, not particularly stand out because it is a ultimately a, like a modern romance series, right? Like there, there are no action sequences uh, per se, but the visuals of it are um, just really, really uh, gorgeous. There's a lot of stuff around the environment, around uh, nature, even though they're in the middle of the city. Uh, thus, after the rain. So, if you like those sort of more contemplative anime series, and something that plays around with romance, um, but in a very comedic way, um, but that isn't like going too far deep into it, at least as of episode one, um, I think this is going to be right up your alley. It's that kind of a, kind of a show. Um, so, one that is um, definitely a lot of, of art and effort put into it. Moving on to Basilisk. This is on Crunchyroll. The previous one is, on, is only on Amazon. Um, Basilisk is actually a remake. There was an anime series of this, gosh, 10, 15 years ago, uh, that was pretty popular when it came out. Uh, I know it's based on, a, I believe, a manga. Um, and what's interesting about this one is that it's, it is a, it's an action series about, uh, kid ninjas. And, of course, we kind of leap to Naruto. But this is, like, um, dark, brutal kid ninja stuff, where, like, one of the um, you know, one of the kids during training is almost throttled to death um, in episode one by one of the teachers, kind of to teach the, that kid a lesson. So it's yeah, like it gets really darn dark. Um, uh, definitely fluid action animation. Um, definitely going after that action fan. The the kids all have some special ability or some special twist to what they do. Um, so one of the kids actually has like a pistol, um, which is not like a, a you know, a, a, a power, but, um, uh, it's not, um, so yeah, it's not, you know, it's not supernatural. Some of the kids have kind of supernatural powers. It's kind of dark and gritty. I should also mention, um, one of the plot threads that they kind of throw it at, right at, right there out you, out at you is that this ninja clan is dying out. There's almost nobody left. Um... And the adults have said that they're going to have to essentially breed um, two of these kids once they're, you know, grown up. Um, and they are siblings. Uh, and, like, they really want these two kids get, to get along because, like, they're going to have to continue the line. And I don't know where that goes in the plot, 
but like that is just a, a thing that they say just put right in front of the, the audience in episode one. So I found that kind of creepy. Um, I don't know if it's one of those things where they're going to really delve into this idea of this is the thing we really and like even the characters are like, I'm uncomfortable with this, but this is what we have to do. So this may be something that the, the, the show completely avoids but it is something that will cause some jaws to drop. So just be aware of that. Um, but cool action series with kid ninjas, right? So, hey. Uh, moving on to lighter fare, Cardcaptor Sakura, The Clear Card. The latest anime series in the Cardcaptor Sakura franchise, uh, which started back in the 90s as an anime and uh, uh, based on a manga. The thing about this series is that it manages to perfectly capture the sweet light tone of Cardcaptor Sakura. Uh, Sakura is not particularly, um, not, not particularly innocent show in the sense that like there's goofy comedy, there's a little, a lot of various characters in the show have crushes on each other. So there's all that kind of going on, but it's, it's all very, uh, you know, school kid. I should point out all the characters, and this is one of the, the things that's a little strange, is that all the characters are now just entering middle school but they all still act like they're in fourth grade, frankly. Um, at least all of those kids. Um, that's the thing, is that it, it's very, you know, it, it's... The characters don't seem to have matured or changed at all. Um, and that could be one of the, the, the plot elements, or I don't know. Um, and that could also be one of those things where in episode one of a re, you know, restarting this franchise, you just can't go too, too off the reservation with the characters. So they may be very deliberately doing that. I don't know. Um, but it has that wonderful, fun um, atmosphere with a little twinge of, I hate to even call it darkness, but of a little bit of drama, a little bit of seriousness just kind of injected there now and again. But this is just a confection. It's, it's um, caramel popcorn that you can just you know, munch on all day. And it's, it's, it's really, really wonderful. Um, high production values as well, and oh my gosh, there are Sakura petals everywhere in this show. Moving on to Citrus. I am not quite sure what to make of Citrus. Citrus is um, about uh, two schoolgirls. So on the one hand, it, it, it tries to be very much grounded in modern teenage girls' issues. So issues about fashion and how you look and what... what, what your dress and and how you present yourself what that says to other people um issues about sex and how you present that to other people how you know you might brag about having lots of boyfriends but not actually have many or vice versa um, and all that kind of reputation around those things but then the main character goes to this school that is clearly unreal in the sense that like there are dozens of students lined up out front just to watch all the students as they come in for like violations of the school policy and they go into the school and it has this absurdly giant atrium in the middle where all the, the, the students are walking in and out uh, or walking around so it's very um, it's very stylized in that way but then the premise is very classic anime cliche where the girl uh, comes across this other teen girl that she very much dislikes, and then it turns out they have to live together, right? The, the classic thing. Um, the problem with that is it in then throws in, like, lesbian sexual assault at the very end, um, and it's very uncomfortable. The show clearly wants it to be very uncomfortable, I just don't know where they're going with this. Um, there's just lots of different elements all being thrown at you. Um, so we'll have to see where that show goes. Um, but definitely not your typical anime series. Um, I'm intrigued by the stylization. Uh, there's a lot of animation here. There's a, a, quite a high animation budget for a show about modern teenage schoolgirls. Um, and, and also kind of these, these rather serious issues about growing up today. Um, so there's a question in the chat room about, um, you know, uh, middle-aged guy, uh, um, interested in a 17-year-old girl. Uh, the age of consent varies by prefecture in Japan. So 17 is absolutely legal in some areas of Japan. Presumably this is set in an area where that is, that would be, that would be, you know, legal. But it's also very clear that, it's, yeah, 
you know, it's still a very large age gap. Anyway, um, so that's Citrus, streaming on Crunchyroll. Um, one of those ones that definitely, we'll, we'll see where it goes. Uh, Darling in the Franks. <laughs> um, if Gurren Lagann had a baby with Overman King Gaynor and, like, Neon Genesis Evangelion and Eureka 7 are godparents, that would be Darling in the Franks. It's the latest anime series by Studio Trigger that did Kill a Kill and um, Little Witch Academia and some other things. Lots of interesting artistic detail. Uh, it has that stylized Trigger feel to it. Um, so on the one hand, the stuff with the teen... It's, it's, it's a mecha show, but it's more super robot. So the... But it, it has that kind of... That, that overall Evangelion or again sort of Eureka 7 feel where the stuff with the teenagers feels very grounded and gritty and serious. Where like this is... This is life to them, piloting these giant robots. And it becomes clear that that's, you know, it pretty much is life to them. Um, and then, but then the super robot stuff has these, this very um, over the top in the best sense super robot animation. Where how things leap on each other and they're grabbing things and pulling things off. Um, it's Evangelion, it's Gurren Lagann, it's very much in that style. And the design of the main mecha is... Um, pretty absurd. Um, and it's a, it's a super robot design. Um, feminine design as well. So, it's weird. Um, but that, that is an interesting thing. Um, the thing is, um, so it's, on the one hand, if you've seen a lot of mecha series, you'll definitely catch the tropes here. But mecha series, you know, are rarely trying to be massively innovative with their concepts and their tropes. Um, this is set in this interesting universe around teenage pilots. They do a little bit more about explaining why you'd have teenage pilots. And uh, there just seems to be a lot more world building in this than in your average mecha series. Um, so curious to see where that goes. Definitely one of these, oh my gosh, the animation in this is, is gorgeous for fans of animation qua animation classic studio trigger kind of thing. Uh, we'll see where the plot goes, you know, we'll, that, that's always a, a big question with shows like these. Uh, it has these interesting sort of animalian mecha, um, and some lovely environment shots. The, the, the overall aesthetic of the show um, has this um, aspect that it, it is sometimes clean, almost to the point of antiseptic, but it is also, um, um, has these be some beautiful natural environments sort of studied in it as well. So that's interesting. Um, so Darling in the Franks, definitely. This is kind of the mecha series of the season. If you're interested in that, there we go. Um, that's streaming on Crunchyroll. Moving on to Death March to the Parallel World. This is our Trapped in an MMO anime series of this season. Uh, Death March is, has this twist that the main character is a programmer on the MMO into which he has been, in which he wakes up. At this point, it is unclear what, as of episode one, what that means in the sense that, like, he's not reprogramming the MMO under his feet so far, um, but he is very familiar with how these systems are supposed to work. So I'm not sure if that is just a convenient way of getting him up to speed quickly, but it's a neat, interesting concept. Um, um, I'm curious where that is, is moving, what, what's, what's going on. Um, um, personally, I liked it in the sense that he very quickly got into this world, started experimenting, started understanding what was going on, and it feels so far like it's more about him learning how to, the, the protagonist, um, how to do good in that world, you know, how to be a hero in the larger sense, because the thing is, he's an adult, he's like 25, or 30, something like that, I think he's 30, actually, or like 29, something like that. Because um, there's some jokes in, the, in uh, early on that like he's been a coder for like a decade, um, and he hasn't had a girlfriend. So I don't think this is going to turn into like a, a full scale harem anime. Um, and he 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 is definitely a very responsible individual. In fact, the beginning of the episode is all about establishing the fact that he's a very responsible guy. So this is not about him growing up. It's not about him accepting responsibility for the first time in his life. He knows all about that. So that's what's really curious about that about this is what the theme is going to be of the show. Uh, they're going to hopefully short-circuit a lot of those 
I, you know, I'm an angsty teenager who just doesn't want to buckle down and do things. So we'll see. Um, I'm intrigued. Moving on to Hakata Tokonsu Ramens. So a lot of folks are uh, curious about this one. Um, it's a sort of a Bacano slash Durarara style show. Large cast of characters in the modern day, all interacting, or the modern world, all interacting um, part of some big sort of conspiratorial style plot. Um, in this case, it's about um, assassins. So several of the characters are assassins, and they kind of know each other, and they, they have jobs that they have to do. A lot of colorful characters, um, but all... I mean, one or two are pretty ridiculous, but, you know, you're not going to come across a uh, um, uh, an over-the-top anime character in this. It's, it's more grounded than that. Um, still, very interesting concept. Um, um, jazz soundtrack, which is really cool. Um, pretty unclear what the demographic, target demographic is of this show. Um, you know, the guys aren't shirtless a lot, um, or at all. Um, but there, there, there are not a lot of, like, cute girls running around. Like, it, it does not fall into a simple demographic thing of a standard anime cliche. So we'll see where that goes. Um, who knows? Uh, there are some fun little references in there. Um, um, some of the characters work for it. Red Rum Inc. Yeah. So, curious. Um, uh, looks like a, um, um... Definitely not a fun show, but it's a an interesting show. It's a it's an oddball show, and that's often something that uh, does some things that you wouldn't normally expect. Again, on Crunchyroll, um, Hakyu Honshin Engi. This one, it's a shonen series. It actually adapts a shonen manga from the '90s, and it looks like a shonen manga from the '90s, just you know, with modern animation. And that's one of the strange things, is that you get this very. I mean, Classic, classic shonen archetype. There's this evil villainous. The main character has is this teenage boy who's trained in this mountain thing, and now he's being sent off to gather a team of people to defeat the villainous. Right. Um, and then, not to get into spoilers, but like the last half of the episode is him having this really tragic experience where he fails very miserably and publicly in something he's trying to do. And what's interesting is he fails in this very shonen way, where he does something that a shonen character would very classically do and is very badly punished for that. Um, it does not look like he then becomes this, you know, tragic, sad character. Like, he seems to recover very quickly from that. I was hoping they would really change his character. So I don't know if, if that means there's going to be a huge change in terms of, of personality later on. But that is definitely an unusual thing to do in your first episode, to have something that big and dark happen in episode one to your main character in this public way. So we'll see. Um, definitely, f definitely for the shonen crowd, you know, the One Piece, Dragon Ball Z crowd, right up your, uh, your alley, I would think, for that show. And again, it's on Crunchyroll. How to Keep a Mummy is the, I would say it's the light-hearted, fun, upbeat, well, one of the light-hearted, fun, upbeat comedies of the season. Nothing bad happens in this show. It's about a teenage boy whose father sends him an Egyptian sarcophagus out of which pops a mummy. And because the mummy is, like, this tall and super deformed and cute and can't talk and essentially becomes a pet. It is, you know, walking around and has to, like, get drinks of water from a bowl. So it's, it's a dog, basically. But the weird thing is, um, so it is technically a person, but that he's treating like a dog. So that gets him, takes him getting used to. But like, the entire first episode is just him getting used to taking care of this mummy and just all the comedy that ensues. So there are, def there are clearly other characters who have to take care of similar things. And so far, it is just one of these relaxing sit back, enjoy, you know, popcorn kind of an anime series. If you want something light and fun, um, again, very much a comedy, that's what you're looking for. Um, the Junji Ito collection was getting a lot of attention this season, because uh, Junji Ito is considered one of the masters of Japanese horror. His manga te te uh, generally have not been adapted well to anime, and this is one of those attempts to say, okay, we're going to do it right this time. This first episode of the Junji Ito collection was, in my mind, not the best way to start. 
um, again, trying to avoid spoilers, but the the main character is the villain and is a very pathetic villain intentionally. Like, he's kind of a sad sack of a person. So you're meant to not really feel sorry for him, but he's also a very, very tragic character in that he's just kind of a jerk that no one likes. But he's also a jerk. Like, he, he's very clearly acting out and being a jerk. So you can't really... You don't really sympathize with what he's doing. Uh, and he's basically using these these kind of voodoo-style powers on other kids. But the problem is, like, nothing horrific happens. Nothing really scary happens. Unless, like, you just want to sit back and see scary images, then it's scary. And there, there are one or two um, creepy bits of imagery. But, like, again, trying to avoid spoilers, but, like, I don't think anybody dies. It's just people getting in danger. And then it ends in a, this, on this very unsatisfactory note for a horror anthology series. So it doesn't really make sense in that sense. I just, I just don't get it. Um, it. It just didn't... Again, for the godfather of Japanese horror, the first episode was just not scary at all for me. Um, so maybe that was just me hyping it up. I don't know. Um, hopefully future episodes kind of ramp up the horror. Who knows? It could also be one of those things where that's the, that is one of those classic stories that just kind of has to be adapted into anime, but like, and, and it's horrifying in the, in the original story, but in anime it just doesn't come across as well, you know, but it kind of has to be there because it is, you know, a classic. Who knows? Uh, but definitely, I, I don't think there are any other big horror series this season. So that is one to just kind of be aware of. All right, moving on to Karakai Jozu no Takagi-san. This is another one that didn't really work for me personally. It is about a teenage boy who's uh, who sits next to a beautiful girl, and they've, they've known each other for years, and she keeps teasing him. So it's one of these kind of four-coma manga-style concepts. But she keeps, like, doing things to get him... Um, noticed by the teacher and all that kind of stuff. And she's always, you know, she always manages to, to not be seen. Uh, but she giggles at him being being caught. And it's one of those things that's really cute until it goes on for 24 minutes. And it kind of feels cruel. Because all she's doing is just constantly teasing this guy and getting him in trouble. And then just giggling cutely. And then repeat, you know, over and over and over again. And it's just like, you have, you know... And she says, oh, sorry, right? And I guess you're supposed to feel it's okay because she's pretty? Maybe? I don't know. And like, clearly he has a big crush on her. Um, and clearly she likes him. I mean, that's very obvious from, like, the, 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 the promo, the promo, the promo yeah, promotional art. But, uh, um, it, it, again, the, the repetition feels cruel to me. So, I don't know. The animation budget is very high. Especially for this concept, and again, it's episode one. Um, there is some cute post-credit stuff, and if they had more of that, I'd be into it. So maybe it's one of those things where they lessen that in later episodes. If so, I'd be fine with the show. It's just, I don't know, they kind of lathered it on thick in episode one. Be aware. But it's definitely one of these sort of school life comedy shows. Um, FYI. Um, again, maybe something that's more for others than me. Katana Maidens is positioning itself to be the uh, Konkoli uh, Kanda Collection or Strike Witches kind of a franchise. It is about teenage girls with katanas who have some kind of spirit power that they activate and, and use with this katana. And they fight off monsters. But also there are these championships that kind of choose which girls are able to do this. Uh, and so the, the first episode shows a bit of the, the monster fighting and then focuses on these championships. And it's basically a tournament. Um, so what's interesting is, on the one hand, but when I say tournament, it is more like a sports competition. You know, it feels much more like a judo competition, which is very formalized. Um, you know, it's not a, a Naruto or Dragon Ball Z style tournament, which is kind of ridiculous and over the top. Um... Good animation budget, um, not ridiculously over the top, but but very nicely done. Uh, wide variety of cute girl characters, no complaints there. Wide variety of, of personality. So again, think kind of girls in Ponzer, Kondai Collection, all the others. 
Um, and then, no spoilers, but they add this interesting plot twist near the end of the episode, which kind of moves the basic story concept in a direction I did not, ante did not anticipate. In other words, it's not just going to be about, okay, we do the championships and we go off and fight monsters. There's more going on there than that, which is good. Um, what's also interesting is that this is set in a version of modern Japan where there are a huge amount of elements of traditional Japanese culture in it. So there are a lot more temples around, a lot more traditional Japanese architecture around. So it's like a lot more of the of Shinto and all those other things survive through to the modern day. And that's just neat to look at. Uh, some lovely background artwork here. Uh, and the overall animation quality is, again, on par with these um, high-profile, multiple cute girl kinds of a show. So, um, one of those shows that, that definitely has the, the budget and the quality to tell a story moving forward with, with these sorts of characters. Um, so, you know, I enjoyed what I saw. And um, who knows? But definitely a... Um, um, you know, with these sorts of shows, you always worry that it's just going to be very generic. Um, or it's going to be, okay, and then they fight monsters every episode. This feels like there's more care to it than that. Uh, contrast that with Killing Bites. This is only available on Amazon. And, uh... <sighs> Killing Bites is definitely sort of... <sighs> it's a shonen fighting anime. You know, characters in bouts. But with ramped up sexualization and gore. So the main fighter is a young woman slash older girl. She... She starts the, the, the show dressed up as a high school girl, but it's unclear whether she is actually that old. Um, she definitely looks a little older than that. Uh, but she ends up spending the, almost the entire episode fighting in basically um, a... in her underwear, frankly. It's a sort of a crop top, and then panties is her entire outfit for most of the show. So that gives you a hint as to what kind of a show this is. And then again, there's sort of violence and blood and, and, and that kind of stuff. So... It's definitely etchy action. Um, there are even, the, the, in, at the end of the episode, there are some naked breasts um, fully drawn. So be aware of that uh, if you're, you know, y your parents might enter the room. And so on the one hand, it feels very exploitative, um, where it's like, okay, we're going to have to throw all this sexual um, um, stuff at you. It's, but it's also just very much, okay, people with weird fighting powers, fighting each other. Um, so it's just, it's, it's an odd combination. I should also point out that it starts with an attempted rape scene. So that's fun. Um, so yeah, it, to be cynical, it feels like it's kind of going after that older teen boy crowd that grew up on like the Naruto's and the One Piece. And they, they still want Naruto or Dragon Ball or One Piece, but now they want, you know, half-naked girls and uh, blood uh, all the time. Um, you know, it's a little unfair to the show, but that is kind of what it feels like. So be aware. Um, and that's not necessarily, you know, the worst thing in the world. Just, uh, just be aware of what that is. Kokoku was one of the su surprises. Also on Amazon. Um, this is a hard one to describe without spoiling. It appears to be a modern day family drama. It starts as a modern day family drama about a fairly dysfunctional... Uh, modern Japanese family in one of these small towns that's kind of dying. Um, and they're trying to get various members of the family to do stuff. And then it takes this hard left turn into this fantasy element that's thrown in. Um, like right after the, 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 the halfway mark, I believe. And then the rest of the episode is exploring that. It feels very much like The Walking Dead. There are no zombies, but think that concept where it is a sort of a fantasy sci-fi concept, but done with what feels like very real characters in a very real gritty situation. Um, and there are some, um, not really action sequences, but um, there are characters with weapons. And, you know, if you get hit with a baseball bat, you go down. You know, nobody here is a shonen protagonist. Um, so... It has that grittiness to it, that very grounded feel, uh, while also having these sort of one-off, you know, odd, not even really powers, but but these th this fantasy element kind of thrown on top of it that these characters are trying to deal with being very normal, modern Japanese people. 
Um, so that's definitely coming out of nowhere. The character designs are by the guy who did um, uh, Kite or Kite and Mezzo, Mezzo Forte. Um, um, I'm forgetting his name, but it is that uh, uh, Umetsu. Um, uh, he did not direct it or plot it, but it, it looks kind of like those things, and I suspect they went with that character design. It's, it's meant to look like those things, like Kite or Kite or those things, where it's it feels like the modern world, but with this weird twist. Um, so definitely, you know, if, if you're... This is one of those definitely completely seinen concepts. Definitely aimed at a, at a, at a more adult audience, um, dealing with, with really serious things, but with that kind of little anime twist, slightly anime twist. Also, again, only available on Amazon. Then there's Laid Back Camp. Boy, kind of the opposite of Kokoku. Laid Back Camp is about high school girls who like to go camping. That's it. That's the concept. And uh, uh, the main character is basically entirely about, um, yes, family, high school, the dead for Kokoku. Very, very similar. Again, there are no zombies, um, but very much that idea of, oh my gosh, we have this harsh thing to do. I should also point out, thus far, no fan service <laughs> in, uh, in Kokoku, and that's the big problem with high school, the dead. Anyway, um, so Laid Back Camp is about high school girls who like to go out camping together. And it's about camping. Clearly very highly researched. Lots of detail about various camping gear and such. Um, one thing I do appreciate, though, is that it doesn't do... Okay, and here is, here is an interlude where we spend two minutes explaining what this element of camping gear is. Instead, it shows them using various camping gear. And a character might ask, what's that? And somebody will say, oh, it's a, a, a stove, for example, and you use this. Um, but they don't sort of pull you out of the story to explain what's going on. They integrate into the story. And there's very little of that. So, um, this is hard. So I grew up uh, doing a lot of this as a kid. Uh, we would go up and rent out a cabin uh, in the woods and do that kind of stuff as a family. And so I very much responded to these, these stories and these images. Beautiful background artwork, beautiful images of just being outside and enjoying nature. So I like that. Uh, that said, the, the characters, it's very much kind of a, you know, K-On goes camping is very much the, the premise. Cute high school girls out doing this thing and, and enjoying uh, life together in this sort of uh, camping club, if you will. So um, that is that is definitely the the slice of life sort of uh, concept um, uh, done for camping, which I, I found really really effective. You know, it's one of those things where some concepts like you understand what they're trying to do, but it doesn't really capture the the feel of the activity itself, and this very much does. All right, moving on to Merchant Machin which is available on Crunchyroll as well. Um, so, Machin Machin is more the standard anime series. You aim very much at otaku. It is about girls going to a magical school, so quasi-Hogwarts, uh, but they're teenage girls from you know, all over the world, so you get some interesting sort of international elements in there. Um... And then one of the girls spends the last, like, five minutes of the episode completely naked. So that gives you kind of a hint of the kind of show it's going to be. There is a lot of nice action. Uh, there's clearly a, a solid uh, action animation budget. Again, episode one, you know, who, who knows. Um, there's definitely the fan service in there. There's some fantasy elements. And so I'm, you know, it's tough. On the one hand, this is not pushing anything forward. This will not, um, you know, nobody will look back at this show and say, oh my gosh, that changed anime. But, and the, the, the constant fetishization of underage girls is also a little worrying. But, um, it, you know, as that very otaku concept, it is that very otaku concept. It is fun and lighthearted. Um, everything in here is, is meant to uh, be be just something you, you sit back and watch and um, can relax to, for, better, for lack of a better word. And there's a little bit of plot, there's a little bit, of, there's a little bit more going on than just, you know, characters running around naked. So, um, you know, there's definitely an attempt there to, to be fully entertaining, right? Not just completely appealing to base instincts, for lack of a better term. Uh, moving on to Miss Koizumi Loves Ramen. This is a show where there's actually not too much to describe here. It is about a high school girl 
who observes another very cold high school girl. I mean, just she does not really interact with any, anybody. She's, she's very standoffish. Who goes to ramen shops and eats ramen all the time and just adores ramen. And this, this is how she, this is how she emotes is through eating ramen. And so the main girl um, ends up more or less stalking her because she's kind of, um, she's intrigued by this girl and kind of wants to make a friend out of her and just is just spending all this time around her. So it is definitely that concept of trying to get somebody else to open up to you and, and do that. There's, there's a slight Yuri implication to the show. I don't think it's going to go anywhere. It, it uh, you know, I, I don't think there's anything romantic there, um, in any sense, you know, any serious sense. Um, but there's definitely that, that fascination with somebody else, with somebody who's very different and who has this, this strong passion and wanting to see where that goes. <clears throat> and we'll have another series very much like that later on. Um, uh, but nice animation quality, very consistent, um, and kind of this fetish fetishization of ramen, which is kind of funny. Uh, Mitsuboshi Color. So this is another, uh, light slice of life comedy about preteen girls. If you've seen Strawberry Marshmallow, it's almost exactly that. Uh, except that these girls hang around in a park. There's actually this little um, shed that they built, sort of a, a playhouse that they hang out in. Um, but they've put together this kind of um, team. They, they consider themselves to be sort of this uh, superhero team going around and um, taking on missions and solving crimes and so forth. And very much as a, in this sort of silly eight-year-old girl way. Um, not that all eight-year-old girls are silly, but you know what I mean. Um, very innocent, very pure running around and playing around. There's a, a local police officer who uh, finds them a, a somewhat annoying, um, but also kind of plays along. And, and then other characters they know of, especially in the nearby shopping uh, arcade. So if you like cute little girls doing cute little things, this is that show, just straight up. If you don't like that, the, the show is probably not going to appeal to you. Um, but it's one of these sort of nostalgic series about the innocence of childhood. And uh, so on that score, it definitely, uh, definitely, definitely scores. A Place Further Than the Universe. This is one of my surprises. This is actually the first show I watched this season. And <clears throat> I tell you, the Moe concept has been so thoroughly reworked and re revised and kind of revitalized by modern, modern studios. On the, if I just describe to you the premise, you'll say, okay, it's, it's K-On, basically. But the execution is quite different. Um, and it's just, it's, it's about a, a bunch of high school gr girls who have this particular dream that they want to accomplish. Again, very chaotic. But it is in the direction. It's in the editing. It's in the realism that these girls really live in modern Tokyo. And they actually go to school. And they actually struggle with things. Uh, they are not simply archetypes, right? It's not the cold girl and the goofy girl and all that kind of stuff. So that is, that is really interesting. And then there, there are the backgrounds and the environments. I can't recall the last time I've seen a school drawn with this level of detail. Um, and the, there's this amazing level of detail to the things around them. So if the characters are discussing some thing, you, you can see on the chalkboard behind them in the background, they're lesson or their homework for the day is a question that is related to what they're talking about. Even though what they're talking about has nothing to do with a lesson, right? Like th that ties in. As they're going around, you know, holding school books, the school book title that you see often relates to something somebody's talking about. All, there are all these little sort of references and elements all scattered throughout the world that plus the things that they're saying and the things that they're doing. It's really, really remarkable. Um, very high animation budget, um, and I'm very curious to see where it goes. They, they picked this very difficult project and something that people generally don't animate in Japan, so we'll, we'll see where that goes. But uh, that was certainly one of the, the, the standout shows of the season in terms of, wow, this, they, they are putting all sorts of effort into this show. Really interesting and remarkable. Uh, Pop, Team, Pop Team Epic has got the uh, the internet kind of blowing up. Uh, people love Pop Team Epic. It is a plotless series of short comedic 
sketches, essentially. Some of them very short, just, just a, a really quick thing. Um, think very much uh, Robot Chicken. Your Robot Chicken done in anime. That is pretty much precisely what it is. There are some recurring characters in this case, these two really weirdly drawn um, schoolgirls. <clears throat> It's the kind of show where it will either work for you, or it won't. You'll find it hilarious, or you'll find it probably the dumbest thing you've ever seen. Just be aware of that, go into it, one of these very just just oddball kind of a show, and they do some weird, weird stuff. Um, you know, a lot of comedy just kind of um, is hit or miss, and this is very hit or miss. Even for folks who like it, there are going to be some things just fall flat for you. So, be aware of that. Um, yeah, yeah, kind of... Dank memes the anime. That's that's not inaccurate. Um, um, and it is also kind of, you know, it throws a lot of stuff at you very quickly. It is meant to be one of these, you know, just constant um, constant jokes, constant, you know, we, we can't bore you. You grew up on Sesame Street and expect constant simulation shows. Um, and again, it, it works for some people and others are going to have issues with it. So be aware of that, um, but definitely something that folks are just, are just, bl are just, uh, screaming and yelling about in the anime world. Um, so Record of Grand Crest War is going to be one of those shows that, again, is divisive in a different way, and that it is the fantasy anime series of the season. You know, characters in a fantasy world, D&D-esque fantasy world. Um, if you've been watching shows like Critical Role and other D&D-inspired shows and want an anime series in a D&D-esque world, um, Record of Grand Crest War is definitely going to do that. What's interesting about this one, for me, is that it appears to be much more political than your average anime series. There's definitely still action, there's definitely still character interaction, and, and hopefully, it looks like some serious character development, but there's significantly more than your average anime fantasy series about, okay, you know, these regions are run by these people, and we're gonna need to do this to impress that person, and that will get us here and do that. Uh, I don't think it's going to overwhelm the show, but there, there's more thought to world building in that sense of of control and power, which is going to be. Which again, I, I like it when anime and particularly these sorts of shows do that. Um, it adds an interesting dimension. Focuses on two main characters: young uh, young man, young woman. Um, I will also credit them for the fact that the girl wears this very ridiculous anime outfit, you know, kind of a classic ridiculous anime outfit where, you know, she's a mage, but she wears like a, a skirt and like which has the, these cut out areas around her. And she actually like jokes about how ridiculous the outfit is. Like there's a in real in-world reason for that and all that. And like she says, this is ridiculously fan -servicey. uh, not in so many words. So good on them for that, for at least kind of acknowledging. Um, and I just found it interesting. Um, the action animation also, I should point out, when they're animating different characters fighting, it feels like actual people with swords. The camera holds on people as they are hitting each other with swords, and there's weight behind them, and like you don't just, you know, like if you stab somebody with a sword, they're down. Um, but it's not just, it's not that highly stylized anime action sequences where you just rush at somebody and then you go past them and then they fall down. Or there's a slash, 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 somebody falls down. Um, there is definitely a pacing and a realism to the action in that sense, while still being, you know, anime fantasy action. So, uh, probably a, the kind of show that's not going to appeal to a huge crowd outside of fantasy fans, um, but for those who are into it, uh, it, it's, it's, it hits a lot of those, uh, those checkboxes. It checks a lot of the checkboxes. Then there's the Rio's work is never done. If you're familiar with a lot of these sort of uh, sports anime, particularly like these board game sports, like Hikaru no Go, and I believe Saki, and um, 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 there are others, but uh, based around Japanese uh, board games and card games and such. This is a, a show generally in that genre. The main character is a teenage boy who is a very, very, very young, um, essentially grandmaster in shogi, or Japanese chess, it is, it's popularly called. It's not, it's kind of like European chess. And he's dealing with this stress of being this very young master. Um, and then this third grader shows up at his door and wants to be his apprentice. So on the one hand, it clearly turns into 
Uh, and then, you know, another girl shows up who also is a shogi master with him, kind of, and is a, a teen girl. And there's clearly a harem-esque aspect to the show. Um, it's definitely a comedy, but there's a lot in the first episode about their passion for this and some of their backstories and why they do this. There is some, there is a fairly realistic, serious tone to the characters and why they do what they do. Um, in fact, each one of the characters that you, you, uh, well, several of the characters that you interact with have this, oh, that you get a moment where you realize, oh no, this this was really serious to this person. Like this really means something to this person. Um, it's not just oh I I love it. I have a passion, um, and it feels grounded, right? It's not just you know my my um, my grandfather taught me shogi and then he died and promised that I would become a shogi master within three years. Right? It's not that kind of a thing. Um, it's not kind of, kind of anime or manga absurd, um, but, like, this is, you know, there's more to it than your average, um, sort of anime, quasi-harem anime series. Some cute stuff in there, definitely a lot of comedy, um, and just kind of be aware of that. Also should, should, uh, note that there's a scene, um, partway through where the little girl takes a bath, um, and then she, like, uh, comes out into the main room, and so there's there are a few brief scenes where she's wandering around uh, naked. Now, obviously, you don't see anything. Um, you know, her, her hair is falling down, and you, you know, um, it's not fetishized at all. But again, you don't want your parents coming in during these scenes. All right, moving on to Sanrio boys, um, and I've seen this um, spelled Sanrio I O and Y O. It's basically about high school girls, very very hot high school boys. Excuse me, who love Sanrio products, like Hello Kitty, and about how much they love that, and they all essentially form it's kind of a club, but a, 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 an informal club around how much they love Sanrio products. This is blatantly paid for by Sanrio Corporation to appeal to girls who want to watch Hot Guys and Hello Kitty at once, right? To be clear, um, all of the Sanrio merchandise is merchandise in the anime series. You know, Hello Kitty, the character, does not pop up and start talking. Um, so it's a very weird premise from the outside, but as this kind of marketing ploy, it definitely makes sense. Uh, there's a variety of, of, of male characters to kind of get interested in and bond with, and there is some surprisingly touching stuff in the first episode around this and dealing directly with the fact that if you're a boy, you know, carrying around Hello Kitty stuff, other boys are probably not going to respond favorably to that at some point as you grow up. Um, so dealing with that and, and the whole question of fandom and all that, it, it is actually there. So just be aware, it, it's kind of a big long commercial, but it is done with heart and there is actual plot and there's actual character there. So whatever. Um, just kind of a fun one. School Babysitters, also a fun one. Middle school boy, I think, or first first year high school, maybe. I think he's, no, I think he's middle school. Um, he and his essentially infant brother are orphans eh, who get adopted into this family where, um, but where they are expected to work in their school's nursery. So basically, you know, imagine a large school, you have teachers working there. One of their... Um, benefits is having an on-site nursery for the teachers. So, you know, you, you have teachers with, with little little kids. They can come to school, drop their kids off in the nursery there, do their teaching, they pick up their kids afterwards. So the boy is expected to, I mean, he studies, he has a, a normal life in that sense, but he's expected to, after his school work is done, go and work, you know, for a couple of hours at the end of the day and, and you know, before the school begins at the on-site school nursery, hanging out with all of these uh, little kids, you know, um, uh, preschool age kids, basically. So, on the one hand, um, th the show is clearly trying to get kids used to the idea that um, young kids aren't scary, and that taking care of young children can actually be joyous because of how cute and fun young kids are, and also very annoying at times, 
right? But it is about, you know, the fact that the kids can be fun to hang around with. You know, they, 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 they have joy and all this kind of stuff. Um, and, of course, all these little kids are very super deformed and cute and running around and doing stuff. So, um, it's adorable. It, it is adorable and sweet. There's some heavy stuff partway through the show. These kids are recently orphaned. Um, but it is ultimately a, a sweet celebration of family and life and children, basically. I suspect it's part of this whole um, drive in, in Japanese culture to get adult Japanese people used to the idea of having children, so they will have more children, because <laughs> Japan kind of needs more children. I don't know. But uh, definitely another one of those series in the sit back and enjoy it. It's this just sweet, light entertainment thing. Um, almost done. Just a couple more. Um, moving on to Slow Start, um, which is about... It's very, very interesting. Um, it is sweet, cute animation. Um, it's basically about a very shy girl who um, joined, who is just getting into high school, although everyone acts like they're in grade school. They all have very grade school personalities, but she's in, you know, they're, they're all technically in high school. And she's never really made any friends, um, but other people in, their, in, in her class start kind of including her in things. And it's about her trying to get involved with this. The show does an amazing job of showing, of, of teaching people how properly to reach out and include somebody who is naturally shy and inward focused and introverted. Somebody who doesn't mind hanging out with people, who wants friends, but doesn't really know how to do that and feels very awkward about it and how, you know, you, you don't shut them out. You don't give them like one chance ever, um, but you kind of, you go slowly. And, you know, if, if the other person doesn't respond really well, then okay, you, you, you maybe give them another chance and kind of see how things go and, and, and again, you just move slowly. Uh, lots of feet. Don't know if that's a thing or not, um, but it's adorable. It, it's definitely an adorable, sweet show in that school life genre, if you're looking for that kind of a thing. Finally, number 26 uh, is uh, Takunomi. An anime series that's only available on High Dive. Um, it's about a woman who just graduated from college like a year ago and is moving to Tokyo for the first time. She's lived way out in the sticks and now she's finally in Tokyo and she moves into a um, basically a house where uh, um, it's a, um, a female only house. So there's like four different women, you know, young working women who all live at this house and uh, so they're kind of safe. And it's her starting to um, uh, hang out with and understand them. Um, so the, the basic premise is it's this kind of early working life, but very lighthearted anime comedy. The characters are not like typical goofy anime characters, but they're more the, the side characters in like a working show. Or a show about, you know, young professionals. Where nobody's really over the top, but they... They're also not, like, real people in that sense. They're, they're somewhat archetypical, which is part of the fun. Um, I should point out it is partly financed by a, a beer company. So there's a lot of beer in the show and a lot of drinking in the show. Um, and folks aren't getting drunk all the time, although there's one character who drinks frequently. Um, you know, kind of, kind of the, 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 the lush of the group, but you know, it's not like she's passed out drunk on the couch every day. Um, so there's a, there's a bit of a feel of like the college dorm room in this show, but it's all, you know, attractive anime girls, which is very nice. And it has that light comedic feel. It feels like a light beer. You know, you drink it, it's refreshing. Um, it's not particularly complex. It's not particularly, um, memorable. You know, you're not going to think back on that, you know, uh, next year and think, oh my gosh, that was the best thing I ever, I ever had. But in the moment, it's really fun and really refreshing and um, definitely worth, you know, um, worth a check if you want something in that vein of, of being um, uh, upbeat. Also nice having all adult women 
um, um, uh, in a cast and just kind of seeing what it's like in the working world and living with all of those pressures and so forth and so on. Obviously, those things aren't a massive part of it, but, you know, it's like that. So, Recovery of an MMO Junkie from last season is kind of in that vein where, yes, there's stuff going on. So, kind of remove all of the MMO and all of the, the, the romance stuff and just focus on that kind of, I'm a person in the working world and, and dealing with all those things. That's kind of what that is. Um, light, upbeat, fun. Um, and a show that I definitely found just straight up enjoyable. Yeah, not, de not deep, but enjoyable. All right, so that is that is all the shows that I got a chance to watch from the winter 2018 uh, season. Thank you all very much for watching, and uh, hope you check out more stuff here for more stuff about anime and other cool geek things.